Honorable St. Michael South Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have to thank the honorable member who led in this resolution, uh, not just for his very thorough presentation on this physical development plan, um, but also for taking something that is so central to the prospects of Barbados and Barbadians, continuing to take it very seriously as the now Minister of Planning, continuing to work very well and very closely with the officers of the Planning and Development Department who also take this work extremely seriously. And, and in fact, it is really their lead that we follow when we come to understand how important this work is for the prospects and the development and the future of Barbados and Barbadians. So I will not repeat all of the thanks. Um, he has called all of the names. I will only say that I felt very privileged to have been a part of this process. Uh, I feel that we took it very seriously and I'm glad to see after I've made several calls to see the plan and to have it function, because I hope in my brief remarks to get to that question of its functioning and of its use. Um, but I'm very happy to see that we are here at this point. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, one of the other reasons that I have felt so privileged to work with the Planning and Development Department is that, you know, as a development economist, um, as someone who's been a practitioner, um, sometimes you come to this work with a particular perspective, and you come to this work with a particular set of skills, and you try your best to use those and to expand those. Um, but I do have to say thanks to the officers of Planning and Development Department for the opportunity to expand even more in terms of the area of physical planning. I say to them all the time that um, they are great teachers, um, and they have been. And, and I think that the relationship between a minister who is meant to guide policy and the practitioners who are experts in their field is key because ministers have to do the learning a lot of the time if you do not come with the particular skills. And it was certainly a privilege for me to be able to do a lot of that learning together with them. And it, is, it has really been one of the joys of my ministerial career. I say it has been and not was because um, <laughs> I will leave that hanging there. But, sir, I, I start there because, you know, I, have a very good colleague, a Jamaican economist, um, who, who's now at, at MIT. And he is an associate professor of um, political economics and urban planning. And when I saw him make that twinning and make that decision, um, it occurred to me that economics is really about the provisioning of goods and services and well-being to people, to people. It's not about numbers, it is about provisioning to people. And one of the greatest assets we have to provision to people is the physical environment. How do we manage this physical environment so that the people whom we serve can protect it, but also benefit from it? Can protect it, because we are not here just to exploit the earth, can protect it and benefit from it such that we preserve it for future generations. That's the business of economics. And so when my colleague ended up in the area of urban planning and economics, it made perfect sense. I say that to say what? That there can be no separation, really, of this question of understanding and managing resources for economic and, and social development without looking at physical development. 
And if one looks at this, at these volumes, one sees how central physical planning is to everything that we do. And sometimes I don't think we understand how central it is. The Honorable Member for Christchurch West gave a very, very thorough background in terms of the history of the Physical Development Plan. But, but I, I, I want to come to the background from perhaps a, a slightly different perspective, and that was from the experience of working in planning and considering certain applications. And, 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 the, and the Physical Development Plan, you will find, speaks to the tensions that exist in planning, especially in a country of the size of Barbados. And what do I mean? The chief town planner, the then chief town planner, would receive, and I say the chief town planner because regulatory procedures are managed by the regulator. The minister, nor the prime minister, nor the cabinet are not the regulator. The director of planning and development and the team are the regulator. And so when a decision is made, and along with the board, um, that now exists, but when a decision is made, it is made at that level. Um, and it is only where the minister has to come in to perhaps adjudicate a matter, for want of a better word, that then the minister has a role. But I want it to be clear that this is a regulatory process that is handled by the regulators, and the regulators in this matter, and these matters, are the planning and development department. But there are certain tensions that necessarily exist when it comes to planning in a small island. It means that you have tensions, for example, between agriculture, land for that use, land for the purpose of housing, land for the purpose of commercial development, land for the purpose of renewable energy and meeting the targets that have been set for 2030, um, land for the, the, the purpose of recreation. These are the tensions that exist. And I call them tensions, and, and the minister, the, the, the member for Christchurch West made reference to it in the language of the PDP. And the language of the PDP talks about alienation of agricultural lands, which I think is a very loaded word. Um, and and, and it's, it, is, it is such a loaded word, and it is so used because, and the officers will tell you that because the process of, of considering an application means that you are getting comments back from certain sectors, you would have a situation where there's a commercial application. And, the, and the, our friends in agriculture would say, no, 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 no. That's agricultural land. And PDP says, that's agricultural land, and we're not going any further with this. And I, as I would often remind the officers, your, your guidance is a recommendation. It's not an approval or a denial. But one understands the tension because there are several competing draws on the resources that we have. We have to grow food. We have to build houses. We want to make sure that our um, supply of energy is sustainable. We want to have businesses. We want to run boat and play football. We want to breathe clean air so we don't want to live in concrete jungles. These are all the competing tensions. And, and I recall at one point saying to the then deputy chief, um, wh 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 where do we put all of these competing needs together in one place so that we can see and understand how much we have land and then how we use it? And there began the conversation of the then draft 2017 physical de development plan. And the fact that, as it was, and, and you know, <laughs> politically people tend not to say these things, but as it was in 2017, it was a very solid document. People get frightened to refer to former administrations, but it's not about the administration. In this case, it's about the officers and the team that worked on it. It was a solid document, but what it did not benefit from 
was all the things that have so rapidly changed and were continuing to change in that intervening period. And the Honorable Member made reference to so many of them. Um, and so we realized that there were certain things that we had to amend. We had to account for. We had to look at this question of heights. And it is still something that bothered, that concerns me today because I wonder how much we will continue to, to spread out in single family dwellings for housing rather than go up. And I'm sure that the honorable member who's responsible for housing, when he addresses this, these matters, will have a perspective that I'm sure reflects whatever is the cabinet's perspective. But it was this amendment came from very practical needs and concerns. Um, and, it, and, it, and it also had to consider the issue of population. And I want to make something very clear from this honorable place because it is a bit of a, of a curiosity to me. The conversation that we are having about population, the conversation that has been led by the Population Commission, the recommendations that the cabinet then considered and took. When we talk about what is the trajectory of the population, the fact that we now do not have enough people to be able to sustain the standard of living that Barbadians expect, that's what it's about, you know. It's not about just getting more people because we like to look at people. Barbadians have, have, have certain expectations and, and a, there's a population base that must hold those up. I went, I went, I went remember for St. Michael Northeast, Honorable Prime Minister, keeps referring to population. It is not to ask people to go out and do the natural thing that would naturally increase the population. That is not the call. Let me be clear on that once and for all. So for all the people that whenever we see a reference to population, we think it is about saying, go and have more children. Well, yes, I mean, if people would like to naturally grow the population in a, in a way that makes sense to them, that is a natural thing. Government cannot legislate that. Although there are things that can be done and that are contemplated in the population report to make it so that families, as they grow, are supported. That is an important policy decision. But when we talk about population and how we grow it, the, the, the chief call there is managed migration. How do we create an environment here first and then create policies that allow us to attract groups of people who will contribute to the growth and prosperity of the country alongside all Barbadians. The population report importantly, importantly, and I encourage Barbadians to have a look, first talked about making sure that all Barbadians who are alive now can contribute, can be productive first and foremost, before we start to look at growing the population through managed migration. The population report looks at the extent to which young people are able to find work and find income and be productive, the extent to which all groups are able, of Barbadians first are able to contribute, but even with the highest levels of productivity of the Barbadian population as counted by the last census, we still cannot get there. And so it then calls on the Honorable Member for Christchurch East, the Honorable Minister responsible for immigration, to challenge us and tell us, how are we going to come up with these kinds of policies? So I wanted, sir, to settle that matter, that when we're talking about population, we are first looking at making sure that our current population and their future generations have a role, have a stake, have a say, are able to meet their full productive capacity first. We look second at policies that support families and the, and the proper functioning of the family. And we then look at the question of managed migration. But all of these things come in to the need 
for a physical development plan, and, and the honorable member talked about master planning. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think that it perhaps takes not the first woman or not the second woman, but maybe the third or fourth woman to say, the, say it, to repeat something so that a man hears it. Because I know that the Director General was not the first to talk to the honorable member about master planning. But I'm glad that her words on that occasion were the ones that stuck. Um, and I want to say that I do agree fully. And I recall that when the honorable member was Minister of Housing, we had that conversation about the need for a master plan in the housing sector. Because master planning is not just about geographical area, it is about purpose. It is not just about looking at Warrens or looking at Oystens or looking at Spikestone or looking at Bridgestone. It is about purpose. We need to master plan by purpose. So that we need to master plan housing, so that if we know we are targeting 30,000 or 40,000 or 100,000 homes, we need to understand how we're getting there, not just in terms of land space, but in terms of housing approach, in terms of technology, and so on. We need master planning in transport and works. We need master planning in transport and works. So, so that this master planning is not just about the area, but it is what are we aiming to deliver. And when you start with the what are you aiming to deliver, then perhaps you get to where can you best deliver these things? How do people want to live? How are people moving? How do we want people to start to move? And I'll give you an example that is featured in the physical development plan. You know, we talk about the renewable energy goals and targets and how do we not just decrease our own emissions, but how do we re reduce our fuel bill or energy costs? Because importing fossil fuels is so expensive for us as a small country. And so we know that the renewable energy goals will not just call for electric vehicles. And I, and I, and I do know uh, that the government is having these conversations really about the financing, the economics of, of this issue, the, the, the cost of batteries, the infrastructure of recharging. These are very important things. Um, this sector is not going to go anywhere unless people have settled in their minds that it's sustainable to have electric vehicles. It's not going to go anywhere. And so I hope if, and I do recall that the Ministry of Finance was doing some work in that regard to say, not just from a macro perspective, what are we losing in terms of revenue, but how can the average person afford to drive an electric vehicle? We know where the gas stations are. Do we know how many charging stations we're going to need and whether we'll have the wherewithal to do it? Do we know, do we know how much it's going to cost to replace an, a battery after six or seven or 10 years? And so this is the information that is required. But further to that, we're not going to get to this place just by switching out each car that exists on the road today for an electric vehicle. We actually need to have fewer vehicles. I don't know if it's something that Barbadians are yet willing to confront, but we actually literally need to have fewer cars on the road. In order for us to do that, and I've said this in this honorable place before, in order for us to do that, it means that you, Mr. Speaker, would be happy, and the honorable member who just spoke, would be happy to leave your cars at home or get rid of them and take public transportation. Because if we in here are not willing to do it, if it's not up to a standard that we would access, we can't ask the rest of the Barbadian public to do it. And so all of these policy ideas must be contemplated when we talk about master planning in a sector. Sir, before I continue, I do have to speak to the question of the role and the purpose of the plan, of the physical development plan. 
I think we have understood from the Member for Christ Church West what it is and why it is so important. But I would not know how to retire from having this, the floor here now, without raising something that was, again, one of the tensions when we work together as a team in the Planning and Development Department, which is what, what is the role of the plan? How does it fit with the Planning and Development Act? Because this is a plan. This is a vision. The act is law. And so I think it is important to call the attention of those who would want to review the plan to the sections 5.1 and 5.2. 5.1 of the plan speaks directly to its role. And the fact that the purpose of the implementation section is to provide direction, interpretation in applying the policies of the plan. Um, but the plan itself provides policies that establish the what and where, what and where conserva conservation, settlement, and infrastructure investment should occur. And the implementation section of the plan talks about how these policies would be implemented. Now, I, I would not be able, of course, to go through all of the functions, but I think it's important for people to understand. And when I say people, I mean the, con the, the, the clients of the Planning and Development Department. Um, developers, I mean, invariably everyone is a client of the Planning and Development Department at some point, almost. But the plan is meant to provide standards for the approval of planning applications. It's meant to provide standards for the consideration and approval of the planning applications for all development. It's meant to provide guidance on locations and priorities for the public and the private sector. Why is that important? You know, when you are responsible for physical planning and investment, often, and I think it comes from a way that we approach governance, and it regrettably comes from some perhaps past bad practices of previous administrations. But when you're responsible for planning and investment, often you get a call from somebody who says, I want to do X or Y, and I want to talk to you about it. And certainly for me, one of the things I would say is, oh, you don't need to talk to me about it. If you are clear on what you want to achieve, where you want to do it, you, you've identified the land, you have your plans, kindly make your application and the regulators will handle it. Now that may seem a bit hands off, but I'll tell you why that's important and why this is important. The private sector and the public sector need predictability in their investments. We, the, the private sector has been crying out, and this is a global private sector, not just here in Barbados, for an understanding of what will find favor with the regulator and under what circumstances. And when we came to service in 2018 as a government, that was one of our priorities when it came to planning and investment, to give predictability why? Not just so people can plan their business and invest more successfully and have a greater chance of being told yes rather than no, but quite frankly, because if you make the regulatory process as open and transparent as possible, there's less of a place for corruption. Nobody has to call you and ask you for a favor to favorably consider something that is falling outside because they don't know what will, what will fly. What will fly is here. What is likely to fly from the perspective of the regulator and the overall development goals of the government is here set out in the physical development plan. Now, the role of the plan is to give that guidance and show that alignment um, and it's to act as a framework for decision making that is accessible and available to all people, citizens, landowners, invest investors, and government officials. And so,
applications that, in the opinion of the Director of Planning and Development, um, that conform with the policies of the PDP, in, in the case where the, those um, applications do not conform with the policies of the PDP, the applicant may be refused without further consideration. May be refused. And what, what I mean by this is that if an application is submitted and it is clearly in contravention or against the overall guidelines or purpose or direction of the PDP, it may be refused without further consideration, but I think it's important for people to understand that that's not the end. It may be refused, but the Director of Planning and Development may, may deem further consideration of the application warranting. All of that to say that the PDP is not a rule book. And so the Director of Planning might say, look, this is in such contravention of the PDP, we cannot consider it. Or she or he may say, it does not strictly conform to what we have in the PDP, but it is worthy of further consideration for a certain number of reasons. I think it's important to make that clear because in our conversations, I think there has been uh, this notion that the PDP is not law. It is not law, but it accompanies the act. It sets out the guidance and it makes it much easier for the regulators to be able to, sh to, to, to show why an application may not go forward or to be able to say, well, this calls for some change to the PDP, but we believe that it is a worthwhile change. And in such cases, the PDP may actually have to be amended as a result of the importance of that application. And it is right here mentioned in the document itself. But I encourage everyone to look at pages 170 and on, sections 5.1 and 5.2, because it very importantly and very, very necessarily talks about the role and the purpose of the plan. I, I have to say, though, that I think that the predictability that is given here in this document has to be matched by a certain level of predictability in the economic or financial, on the economic or financial side. So that just as, a, as an investor, and when I say investor, I mean anyone here in Barbados or abroad, may, will want to know what are their chances of getting a yes, and those chances are laid out in this PDP. Similarly, they will also want to know what are their options for fiscal incentives. And that framework should be similarly predictable, should come here just as this PDP has come here, so that on the one hand, investors understand these are, these are the physical requirements, on the other, these are the financial requirements. This is what I can ask for. Don't ask me for anything that's not in here. And this is what would require a special, and a very special dispensation with a process for getting that special dispensation, that process is not a phone call to somebody that you hope can do you a favor. What I mean to say is that we can pass as much legislation as we want, but if we do not accompany that with more predictable and clear systems that people can look at something and see what to expect, we are not in anything. So, sir, with that, I want to come quickly to the the real practical purpose of this document. And really, the, the honorable member said it before me. It is really about the orderly development of the country. The orderly development of the country. And, you know, I think that we have an opportunity with the passing of this resolution, once, if it does pass, we have an opportunity to stop leaving things dangling. And I really feel that we, you know, that this, this, this government has given such a, created such a landscape for 
real development to take place. When I say real development, I don't just mean numbers and growth, which is important, a necessary but not sufficient condition for the development of people, right? But such a clear landscape. But I feel that, you know, there, there's some further leveling that has to be done. So for example, the document makes reference to strategic reinvestment areas. I know the honorable member for the city of Bridgetown, not to set him up, but he's likely to have a lot to say on this. When we hosted the Tourism Investment Forum in 2019, that was where strategic reinvestment areas for a certain, for Greater Bridgetown really was the focus. And one of the things we determined then, and it was very clear in the messages of both myself and the honorable members of Michael Northeast to those who had come to be a part of the forum, that first and foremost, the urban renewal and strategic reinvestment of the urban area is first and foremost about Barbadians, about the people living in those areas. We want the investment. We want the development. But we said to the investors at that time, understand that you are not coming here and building things and leaving people in the surrounding communities behind. These communities must be better off for you having built something here and operating something here. That was a clear message. And I, I, I believe that that must continue to be the message when it comes to these strategic reinvestment areas. And so we have the government of Barbados has a policy, has a, has, a, has a piece of legislation on vending zones, on vending. There must be an integration in the implementation of that legislation and this physical development plan so that these strategic reinvestment areas cannot just be about saying, um, we believe that this kind of establishment can go here and this kind of establishment can go there. But it must also be about integrating people's livelihoods into those areas. Where is the administration of vending zones such that we do have this orderly development of the country? Because we have to be careful that we don't promote rights without responsibilities. We have to be careful that we don't promote the rights of people to vend without the responsibilities that accompany those rights. And so the orderly development, the predictable development might mean that vending takes place in certain areas in a certain way. I do not see so far where we are executing that. I know that I am working my hardest to have the Halls Road Commercial Village established after having it been approved. But this is an example, sir, of what I mean by strategic reinvestment areas working for the people that live there. Because I certainly don't want to see more hotels in town before I see the Halls Road Commercial Village in town. I certainly do not want to see that we are focusing investment on foreign direct investment and not also bringing along the people who have been, that's the private sector there in Halls Road, you know. That's the private sector. Private sector, don't always be sitting down in a fancy room at Lloyd Erskine in a jacket and a tie. And so I hope that we take this physical development plan as an opportunity to fast track these efforts that are really going to be touching people. The issue of signage. I don't want to, I don't want to, sir, be, you know, kind of one of those people that's still, you know, shaking a stick at people and saying, in my day, I never want to be that because I plan to be young forever. <laughs> but, I recall that when we were working together as a team on the Planning and Development Act, the issue of signage 
How do people put up signs? What kinds of signs? Whether they would be these big neon electronic signs all over the place, or whether they would fit into the amenity of the area. Can people park a car that's for sale and say, well, this car is for sale. I'm going to drop it here on this, on this shoulder, this road. That is what we mean when we talk about orderly development. And that, that is really one of the things that has to be has to be thought of when we talk about master planning areas. You know, I really anticipate that as part of the change management that is currently going on in the planning and development department, that there will be more emphasis on the forward planning function of the department. And I know the honorable member is listening to me closely um, because I think he and I agree on how critical this is. None of this is possible. All of what you see in the physical development plan is forward planning. Master planning is forward planning. So the role of the planning and development department is not just about reviewing applications. It is not just about enforcement, which is another area that requires significant investment. I don't mean to sound like I'm, like I'm moralizing to the, to the minister. He knows and agrees, and he's working very hard on all these matters. The question of enforcement, but also all of this is forward planning, meaning to say that, you know, you can tell when a country happened by chance. <laughs> you can tell when development happened by chance. Something pop up there, it looks one way. Something pop up next to it, it looks another way. And the minister, the honorable member said something very important, that it is about cumulative impact. But I will go further to say that it's about cumulative and concurrent impact of things. Now, the, 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 the pattern of the Planning and Development Department is to review applications in isolation, which most planning and development departments do. You get an application, you look at that. Another officer is next to you, she or he is looking at a different application, you look at that. Those two things might be next to one another and look completely different from each other. And so really, there has to be a mechanism by which you are considering applications in one area together to say, what do we want this area to look like? What do Barbadians want this area to feel like? What do Barbadians do in this area? Do they go to the beach? Do they go fishing? Do they line? Do they work? Do they only pass through? All of that is what physical development planning and forward planning are about. But we need to take it to the next level where we're not just approving applications. We're not just doing enforcement, which we need to do more of. And, and, and we need to do more, we need to be more vigilant. So we need to be looking at buildings at developments as they're going up and realizing, look, you, this is not what we agreed that you could do, so undo this and start over. It calls for resources, I understand, the officers are stretched, but I hope that if we believe and agree that this document is critical, that we put the resources behind being able to give it effect. So I want to come very, to, to two final issues. And I don't want to preempt the honorable member for the city of Bridgetown, but having worked on the Tourism Investment Forum and the strategic reinvestment areas, Bridgetown and the Greater Cardell Bay area, and having, that had, having had a central place in how government at the time was seeking investment, I do have to speak to the issue of Bridgetown. And what do we want Bridgetown to be? Because the planners will tell you that, and the demographers will tell you, that settlements happen along particular lines. People settle in areas for different reasons. We know that St. Joseph and St. John populations are declining. We know that the residential population of St. Michael is also constantly in flux. So what we have to think about is, why are people moving? What are they moving for? And what do we want Bridgetown to be? Now, there is an Urban Development Commission. There is Barbados Tourism Investment, Inc. There was a conversation some time ago, um, and, and I remember raising the issue that, that a place like Bridgetown requires something like a, like a Bridgetown 
investment management company. It requires a focused, somebody has to come to work every day to flog that adage. Somebody has to come to work every day to deal with that. And unlike what people believe, the government alone cannot reinvigorate Bridgetown. I recall that when we were looking at certain developments on the west coast of the country and certain developments on the, on the, in Bridgetown on the south coast of the country, that we considered that we should have a fund so that those developers who were coming to have developments in those areas also understood that the overall maintenance of the area required the efforts and the finances of all who were having investments there. And, and there was meant to be established a Bridgetown Rehabilitation Fund, I, th I thought it, I think it was called, or something to that effect, which would mean that for things like drainage and sanitation and sewage and road maintenance and certain community efforts, uh, that those in developers would contribute some percentage of the value of the investment to these efforts. Similarly, I think that a Bridgetown management company would have to have several functions. The first would be to explore and secure investment in the Bridgetown area. You know, every, nobody wants to be the first mover. Everybody wants to go and build something in a place that already looks nice, but it's not going to already look nice if nobody ever builds anything. And so the government may have to consider some kind of first mover advantage. If you're the first to build, if you're the first mover, if you are bold enough to bet on the people of Barbados and bet on the people of Bridgetown and, and, and to trust, then you may ha get some first mover incentive for having done that. But everybody who's sitting by and waiting to see, well, who's going to build next door to, so I could go and build next to a pretty building. Well, if everybody wait, wait to, for a pretty building to go up first, no pretty building is going to go up. And so the first function of that company must be to chase an investment. But it must also be, quite frankly, to liaise with those who are already, who, are, who remain there. And, and I have to say to the people who make their commerce, who make their living, in Bridgetown, that they are brave, that they are brave, that they, they have shown that they believe in Bridgetown as the capital of Barbados, and they're staying there, even though, even against all odds. And, and, and many of the, of the merchants, to use a dated expression, who are there, are, are remaining there because they believe in it. But I think that a Bridgetown management company will have to engage them to say, look, we need to get together and think about what we want Bridgetown to be. How are we going to fund that? Because these are, this is the private sector. Government has to maintain the common infrastructure. Government has to maintain the public goods. But when it comes to how buildings are being kept and whether people have the resources to be able to refurbish and repaint and so on, that has to be the business of a Bridgetown management company. Because while we have the Urban Development Commission, we all know the resources are stretched with basic urban needs. While we have BTA, well, BTA could benefit from more resources, but also does everything from St. Lucie to, 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 to Christ Church. Who is showing up to deal with Bridgetown? And finally, sir, you know, this physical development plan is... The honorable member who spoke talked about the fact that it won awards, that once it passes, it will be the first of its kind in our part of the world. It is, it is a tremendous accomplishment. The proof of it will be in its execution. Um, but having just gotten here alone, I really think that the leadership and the officers of the Planning and Development Department and the honorable members should feel very proud of that. But I will say that there is work to do in cleaning up some of the dangling things. And one of those is, and, and, and anyone who 
knows the work that we did on the Planning and Development Act would understand why I raised this. <clears throat> I know that the Honourable Member for Christchurch West, and certainly the rest of government, and, and certainly not me, I don't need to hear from other quarters about the importance of a building code. And I'll tell you why I don't need to hear from other quarters, even though people are at liberty to do their advocacy and could, should continue to do so. I don't need to hear from other quarters about the importance of a building code, because a building code was contemplated as part of the Planning and Development Act. It's not a secret. And I really feel that the test of our generation of political servants, the test of our generation of political servants is whether and to what extent we are willing to hold to principle over political expediency. The notion that building codes are onerous on the poor is a fallacy. Building codes benefit the poor. And why is that? Because when I take up the only last $6,000 that I saved up and that my children went to work and helped me put some money down for, to make a change to my house, and the person who does the work does it poorly, I can't find another $6,000 in my lifetime to do it. I would like us to stop perpetuating the notion that regulations are necessarily onus on the poor. They could be. Our job is to make sure they are not. But to run in the other direction from a building code or from parts of the legislation that speak to occupancy and having certain standards for occupancy is to do a disservice to the poor in this country. And if I sound strident and if I sound resolute, it is because I feel strongly about it. When somebody who can least afford it takes up their last money and gives to a contractor or gives to an artisan, and then work is poorly done, and they are at risk, it is a cost to the government, first of all, but it is also a cost to that family. So with all due respect to those who are shouting from their various quarters about the need for a building code, I would dare say that this government knows it. And it was contemplated that we would have a system, a revised system, because you just can't have a building code and go from there, it has to be administered. A revised system with respect to planning and development that would allow for certain standards of building and certain standards of occupancy to be met. So this physical development plan is to be commended. It is tremendous work. And I may not be at liberty anymore to feel proud of my team, but I feel proud of my team. I include the minister, the, the member for Christchurch missing as well. And I say that because, you know, we, we, we in this part of the world, inherited all kind of hierarchical systems from our colonizers. And, and institutions need order. But I think that it is when we realize that it is about how a team works together and all of the various skills and observations um, and arguments. I tell people all the time, you can't hurt my feelings if you argue with me about, a, about a, a, a point on the work that we're doing. You can't hurt my feelings. I want you to. I want you to defend what you are representing. I want you to win because that will mean that you are right and you know what you're doing. And so I think that this document reflects the best of that spirit, of all ideas contending within the Planning and Development Department. I would not know how to sit down without also mentioning two of the names that the Honorable Member mentioned, George and Melanie from Urban Strategies and their team. You know, sitting with them, I, you know, I really hope for Barbadians that we get over what can sometimes be our natural insularity and natural defensiveness against what we consider other and outside and foreign. Because often those people are the biggest friends of Barbados that you will ever meet. It is, it is quite the, the thing to sit in a meeting with two people. Do you want to remember has two more minutes? 
Hey, we're going to that, sir. Two people who are from another place, and to have them talk about this lane and this alley, and that's the place that, if you, where you go to that alley, that's where the, the, the guy they sell these sandals. And these are people that are not from here, that do not live here, but that had so integrated into Barbados that they were able to teach us all things about Barbados that we did not know. That is the spirit in which this PDP has been developed. I think it is a tremendous opportunity for Barbadians to understand the vision and to be a part of the vision as they have been up to this time. This, benef this document benefits from a high degree of consultation, as have most documents that have come to this place. Sir, all that is left for me to do is to commend the Honourable Member for Christchurch West, to give my thanks and utmost appreciation to the Planning and Development Department, to encourage them to, to press on because their work is important to the people of Barbados, and to say that this document must be just the beginning of how we, as the Honourable Member said, integrate all of our planning processes and work together for the best prospects and outcomes of the people of this country. With that, sir, I'm obliged to you.